today I'm going to talk about, well, I thought I would, I would just show some memes um, to begin with. <laughs> it was, it was kind of fun. Um, but uh, just, uh, yeah, just, just to uh, um, skip a bit the, the cool AI generated um, puffer jacket of, of the Pope um, and the, the meme um, between statistics, machine learning and deep learning and AI. Um, we're going to talk today actually about Web3 and, and data modeling um, and the opportunity to unleash this potential of the, of the digital frontier. So I've prepared a couple of slides um, so I don't do an entire uh, presentation without it. So it's easier for you guys to follow. Um, and obviously, let me know your opinions in the comment section or just uh, hit me up later on, uh, on LinkedIn. Um, would love to know how you felt about this session. Um, so we're going to talk about the transformative journey of, of blockchain from anonymity to identity um, through wallets and the whole KYC process, the, the centralized exchanges, the NFTs, uh, and highlight the um, evolution of, of privacy and data. Um, which is a very important component because we can't talk about AI without talking about the data. And we're going to look at uh, large language models that can leverage on-chain data, uh, depict a future of precision in advertising, potentially customer acquisition, business models. We're going to try to look at different use cases. Uh, maybe we can all come up with, with more use cases after the presentation. Um, and how everything interconnects in Web3, because I think it's such an interesting space. We have so much dynamic data um, that's being untapped and unused. So there's definitely a lot of potential there uh, for, for AI. Um, so the key themes I'm going to target today, uh, Web3, right, which is the evolution of the internet, a decentralized realm, where user-owned data is the cornerstone, uh, transactions are secure um, most of the times, <laughs> and information is intelligently interconnected. Um, this is a data-driven, user-centric ecosystem powered by cryptographic proofs, right? Digital identity, which is um, the tech-enabled um, representation of an individual's uh, personal, personal, personal identifiable information, so PII, and credentials in the digital realm, allowing to secure identification and authentication across various um, online platforms and services. And then we're gonna also target AI, right? A branch of computer science that enables machines to mimic human intelligence, uh, learn from experience, adjust to new inputs, and perform tasks that are traditionally require, um, are, um, they, they require human level intelligence such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision-making, translation, um, pattern recognition, and all that. So I hope you're going to like the whole, <laughs> the whole journey. Um, let's talk about a, bit, uh, a bit about a, a blockchain in the, in the digital age, because um, I was at a presentation about two weeks ago where this finance guy said, oh, Let's not talk about Bitcoin. Let's not talk about other cryptocurrencies. Let's just talk about blockchain. And to be fair, there's no blockchain without Bitcoin, right? Um, Bitcoin was the first, the first um, currency uh, that integrated an, an open ledger. Uh, and we can't talk without, about, about blockchain without mentioning that and without going back to the roots. Um, and blockchain is also the beating heart of the Web3 revolution, right? We have all these assets uh, that are on-chain, they're transacting, um, they're connecting us in different ways. Um, as a transparent digital ledger, um, blockchain empowers us to um, control our online interactions, financial data, and understand the immutable nature of transaction input and output. Um, which is something that we wouldn't be able to do unless we had, like I said, this transparent layer. For example, um, if you're using, um, most of us are using Visa or MasterCard, uh, MasterCard makes over 4 billion a year, maybe more now, from data that is not directly related to the financial 
direct data that that we we use and we provide right from interactions between our credit card and uh, or debit card and uh, the POS and the shops where we we buy and we spend our money. So that's four billion. None of that goes back to to the user. None of that goes back to the account holder. Um, but then this can be changed with the fact that we have an, an open ledger where everyone can see that, everyone can take the data and monetize it. Um, and you can actually build interesting um, reward programs as well. Um, the, the impact of blockchain stretches beyond cryptocurrencies, um, seeding disruptive innovations like DeFi and NFTs, uh, infiltrating sectors from finance to all the way to healthcare. In, in a more um, broader or more limited capacity, obviously, um, there's very few use cases for healthcare um, based on, 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 on my experience of, of working for a few years on a, on a health tech startup. Um, but you can, um, you can do uh, some things with blockchain in, in healthcare, for example. You can, um, um, you can timestamp when, when an entity accesses your data, your health data, right? Which is very sensitive, it's, it's very personal. Um, but it's, it's fairly difficult to store all that healthcare data on a blockchain because a lot of the patient data is dynamic. So it changes over time. Uh, it's, not, it's not static like uh, you have in, in finance. And then there's also the digital identity play in Web3 that's powered by blockchain, right? We have centralized exchanges that require your identity um, and your business and personal identity to, to transact and to get access to different uh, financial services. You have decentralized exchanges, you, ha you have por portfolio tracking apps, decentralized naming um, services like ENS, so bound NFTs, right? These NFTs that are bound to your to your wallet, um, proof of ownership done through tokens, uh, web and hardware wallets, uh, token bound accounts, right? You have this new standard called ERC six five five one, that um, um, basically your NFT becomes your wallet. Um, so it's going to be interesting, especially on the privacy side, to see how it rolls out. Um, you have Nostra verified identities like um, NIP05 uh, and, and all these um, different applications that are connected to, to the open web and, and to Web3. Um, a few uh, Web3 use cases uh, that I thought it would be interesting to mention here, um, the privacy and, and digital infrastructure, right, with decentralized identity and self-sovereign identity. Uh, blockchain-based games, uh, metaverse and virtual environments, creator economy, uh, DAOs, DeFi, asset tokenization, asset fractionalization, right? You have that in real estate, um, crowdfunding, um, the advertising potential of Web3, the user acquisition, the new business models and the loyalty and community building in Web3 that is very particular to the space. I'm sorry if you hear any background noise. Um, evolution of identity on a blockchain, right? We have wallets and we have the KYC component, which links our, our in real world identity to, to um, a, a virtual identity um, and, and lets us connect uh, and, and transact. You have um, centralized exchanges, NFTs. Um, and here I just highlighted a, a few things that I, I thought was were relevant for for the evolution of identity, right? Because we went from uh, there's no identity on a blockchain to all of these um, tools and, and applications and standards that really drove us to connect our identity, our real life identity to the wallet that we're using. Um, so the evolution of, of identity on the blockchain reflects this transition from uh, anonymity or pseudonymity transactions to personalized experiences. Um, wallets, KYC, and centralized exchanges have paved the way for users to establish their identity on chain, which obviously comes with risks, but um, I'll let, <laughs> there's, there's plenty of speakers here today that can walk you through the, the, the risks and the, the privacy implications. Um, NFTs represent a, a new frontier, right? Offering a unique form of digital identity. And we've seen that in the past couple of years. Um, and it was a it, it was fairly refreshing coming from from just the 
you know, just just from from altcoins and and all the, these token um, economies into into these NFT projects that you know really made you identify with the NFT that you held in your wallet and and build different business models and, and IP sharing models and all, all that. So um, a unique form of digital identity. And they enabled um, individuality and ownership in the digital world, uh, contributing significantly to the values and the functionality of Web3. With wallets, KYCs, and centralized exchanges, right, they made blockchain more accessible, more secure, uh, more personalized, uh, and contributing to the uh, fac to facilitating regulatory compliance. Um, some of you may not know, but there were so many hacks just around Bitcoin because it was all of us lost money. It was so hard to to trust in, in an exchange back in the day. It's even hard today, but but ten years ago it was insanely hard. They were very very much uh, they had horrible user experience and user interface <laughs> it was it was quite quite hard and uh, just to to log into an, an exchange and and just use it for for just transacting bitcoin it was absolutely horrible so today we have obviously we've come to a, a better um better stage and um a better um much more user-friendly applications and, and tooling um, which have paved the way for what Web3 is today when you even have uh, mobile wallets and and proof of um, verifications and all that just on, on a mobile, um, it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, NFTs have transparent ownership, right? They've enabled digital scarcity and they impacted unique identification. And these are fundamental elements of Web3's potential. And these are heavily linked to the way we act and transact online um, and to the uh, large, uh, to the large, um, how to say this, to, 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 to the large data um sets that we can provide through through blockchain um and I've, i'm just going to leave this here for a second right uh just to showcase kind of the the identity and data potential um these are uh this this is a uh people's um uh first five thousand days it was a, an artwork sold and it reflected i believe it reflected um the kind of the, the first 5,000 days in in the whole Web3 space. So it was quite quite interesting to see um, each image basically represents a project and that's so, so much rich data there. Um, before we go into, into um, the, the AI uh, and, and Web3, kind of like the merger, <laughs> I want to walk you through the brief history of AI because I think this is very interesting and a lot of people don't talk about it. So the first digital computers were, were built in the 90s, 40s, right? This was at Pennsylvania. They had these massive computers the size of a room. Um, but then the first microprocessor was built in the 1970s, right? And then you had the 1990s, which we, ha we had the first days, the early days of the internet and less than 0.05% of the world were online. Um, and the first phone um, in the mid 2000s, and then we've come all this way to where we are today, 2023. And um, a notable timeline of, of artificial intelligence systems, which again, a lot of times ignored and nobody talks about it. The focus is mostly on, on chat GPT and Google. Um, so in between 1940s and 1950s, we had the first digital computers. And then in the 1950s, we had Theseus, which was a small robotic mouse that could navigate a, a simple maze and remember its course. Um, and then towards the 1960s, we had um, Perceptron Mark 1, which was regarded as the first artificial neural network, and it could visually distinguish cards marked on the left side from those marked on the right side. Um, in the 1990s, we had TD Gammon, and the software learned to play backgammon at a high level, just below the top human players. And um, again, I'm not sure about this information, but if, if you're part of my generation, um, the, the, the 80s generation, you've probably used Yahoo Messenger 
when you were growing up uh, as a teenager. Um, so Yahoo Messenger had all, all of these games and applications. Um, and one of them was Backgammon. So it was, um, I, I believe it was powered by TD Gammon, but I'm, I would need to double check on the information. Um, the 90s were an interesting time regarding AI. Like Japan onboarded this massive project uh, this this national AI project, and they had to abandon it, um, for example, because the the financing uh, was drying up and the resources were not there, and the the capacity to really run large scale AI was not there. Um, and also the hardware wasn't there, right? So looking back now, they probably would have been much, much further, much much further in terms of development if they had managed to keep afloat for 30 years, but um, realistically they couldn't. Then in, in 2010, and this is when the peak happened, I'm trying to be mindful of, time, of the time, um, there was a, a, a pivotal early deep learning system called AlexNet. Uh, and it had many layers and it could recognize images uh, of objects, such as dogs and cats um, and cars at near sight uh, human level. And then in the 2020s, we had the artificial intelligence with language and image recognition capabilities. And you've heard, most of you have heard about it, starting with ChatGPT3. Um, the, the language and image recognition capabilities of AI systems, they've improved rapidly, right? Um, so it, it really doubled um, in, in performance um, and, and up to the, after the 2015, it was, it was a, a massive growth opportunity there for, for, for AI systems. And it really took advantage, mostly because our um, you know, hardware and, and infrastructure capabilities have improved as well. You know, we started having 5G, we started having data centers that were outperforming and, and so on. Um, this is quite a clunky slide and I'm, I'm not going to insist a lot on it, but it, it basically talks about the rise of artificial intelligence uh, over the last eight decades. And um, the, the section that you see here with a lot of dots, that's where kind of the chat GPT and, and the AI systems have started popping up. And this is where the, the, the massive evolution happened. Um, so you had a uh, training computation measured in floating point uh, operations called FLOP. And that's a vital element in driving AI capabilities along with algorithm and, and input data. Um, if you wanna take a screenshot of the slide, if not, maybe I'll, I'll share it on my LinkedIn later um, so that um, you don't have to, um, you know, I don't have to walk you through, through it entirely, but just the timeline. Um, like I said, in 1940s, um, up to the, to the 1960s, we had a, a doubling of every 20 months in line with Moore's law. That, mean, that meant that, that deep learning would adva was advancing every 20 months. After 2010 to present, it was doubling every six months. And now I would say we're probably looking at every three to every, yeah, less than every three months something happens. There's a, an interesting size um, over time and, and market map. So the market map is, is quite poor here. Uh, just some, some really well-known um, applications and infrastructure plays and all that. Um, and you can, you can have a look. Um, you can have a look at it uh, yourselves. It's, it's insane. I think um, every, every day, uh, at least a hundred new or maybe a thousand new apps pop up in terms of, of AI. Um, and then on the left, you have a, a size over time of the large language models uh, peaking with 20, the 2020s with uh, chat GPT. Um, and the, the parameters, right, um, went to the, the absolute billions. And I've, I've made here two notes. It's very important. So the size of a large language model significantly, significantly influences uh, performance, ability to generalize and quality of generated output. Right, so bigger models um, uh, also require more data to learn, more compute to run, and makes risk management and mitigation harder. So you have issues like biases, hallucinations, overfitting, etc. Um, but we are at the stage where you have these large language models, um, and you can improve them over time, especially if you're running on dynamic data. 
So AI agents, um, AI agents are an important aspect here and they're heavily linked to, to Web3. And I hope I'll have enough time to run through everything. Um, there's different types of, of AI agents, right? So you can, there's a few apps that you can use. Um, the latest one I've used is called um, Abacus uh, AI. And I've used Abacus AI um, mostly just to test it. But for example, I could pick up a sentiment analysis um, on social media on a given topic. Um, and it would, in five minutes, I would get the, the outputs for that, which is something that would take me normally 40 hours, 10, 15 years ago to run in Python. But today I can do it in five minutes. It's insane. Um, there's different types of AI agents. So you have the, the reflex, uh, the simple reflex agents, right? So they're, they're AI entities that act based on current presets and like keyword trigger chatbots. There's model-based reflex agents. So AI agents considering their, their history for decisions like uh, Roomba learning from past obstacles. There's goal-based agents. And these are AI uh, systems setting and striving towards goal goals like a chess AI uh, planning to win. There's utility-based agents, um, AI entity selecting action based on a utility function like a stock trading algorithm. There's a learning agent, right? AI agents improving over time through experience like machine learning models optimizing with training data. Then multi-agent systems, uh, systems with multiple interacting AI agents like a swarm of mapping drones and then hierarchical agents where you have AI agents breaking complex tasks into simpler subtasks, like an AI coordinating a logistics operation. Now, the best part is that all of this, as long as we have the data, we can bring to Web3. Um, okay, <laughs> just, just, uh, great. Um, in terms of data modeling and, and Web3, um, Web3 comes with significant dynamic data, right? Um, this means that it changes over time. Transactions change over time, they're, they're not static. Um, there's a question over the fact that, do we, do we really need to store a copy of all transactions on the blockchain? Or um, could we have, for example, just store hashes that prove that transaction happen without the, the metadata of that transaction. If this is gonna work or not, I guess we'll live and tell. Um, but it's very interesting because it's open and traceable. So it means, that means anyone can download uh, a data set, can download the history of transactions, can run a node and can access the data. So it, it enables us to reimagine data modeling from, from financial all the way to consumer behavior on chain. And I've, nailed here some, some ideas. So, so for example, predictive modeling, the transparency of, of on-chain transactions can allow AI models to predict market trends, assess risks, and make smarter investment decisions. Uh, DeFi automation, where we can leverage data from open ledgers, and we've already created self-repaying loans, yield earning tokens, and other automated financial systems. So this would be a layer on top. And enhanced risk um, assessment, uh, the traceability of transactions provides a robust framework for social scoring and risk evaluation. And unique opportunities are created here for smarter, more efficient financial and social systems. Um, I would go even all the way to like a social crediting system, but not used in the context of communist countries. Um, we can personalize the, um, the revolution uh, leverage granular data in Web3 uh, for heightened personalization, enhancing user experience and brand loyalty, right? We can um, enable the transparency and accountability side thanks to its immutable records. Um, we can improve supply chain tracking, authenticating origins and reducing fraud. <clears throat> um, and then we have digital identity and privacy uh, where we have decentralized identities in Web3 uh, that put users in control of their data, revolutionizing data management and uh, service targeting. We have innovating advertising, right? This can be the form of um, seeing what kind of NFTs um, people hold in their wallet, for example, or what kind of digital fashion accessories they, they wear on their avatar and tracking all of this on chain and then 
retargeting these people with more creative um, opportunities and, you know, alpha test, beta testing and so on. Um, it's also that's one of the reasons why transparent um, ad tracking in Web3 can perform uh, can transform strategies and use comprehensive user behavioral data for increased ad efficiency. Fraud detection, um, it can enhance real-time fraud detections run by AI systems. Uh, On-chain governance, right, where we have the, the DAO voting patterns and leading to more informed decision-making in on-chain governance. Um, on-chain personas managed by AI agents which are, and, and generative AI for the creator economy. This is why I like to call the future is near because you have um, on, on the on-chain personas managed by AI agents, the advancements in AI uh, really give us uh, on-chain personas managed that could be managed by AI agents using um, LLMs, right? So these, these digi digital twins can learn user behavior and perform tasks on the user's behalf uh, and enable personalized and automated digital experiences, which means you don't have to be really connected to something. You just need your avatar or AI persona connected um, in a metaverse environment, for example, and then you reap all the benefits and, and you, your, your character improves over time or you're acquiring experience and, and uh, you're earning, for example without having to, to do that manually. Um, on the generative um, AI for the creator economy, um, yeah, we have AI powered tools and creatives can already produce unique uh, evolving content, um, paving the way for the, what we call a one, one member startup, which means that an individual can thus independently launch and manage business, democratizing the startup landscape and accelerating cross industry innovation which means that any kind of person that's not highly technical or doesn't know what blockchain development is can engage with uh, an AI and essentially run, have their company run by an a with the help of an AI. And the next uh, stage of, of AI agents um, will we'll look for, for a true potential of, of on-chain activity, leveraging the wealth of, of data for a variety of applications uh, such as autonomous investing, risk mitigation, personalized services, and identity management. Um, and I'll just throw in here um, decentralized identity, the overview of decentralized identity, and you'll understand how where where the blockchain aspect lies. And on top of this, um, unfortunately, I didn't have the time to really create a, a powerful visual. But on top of this, would come an an AI model that manages the identity based on the goals, right? An AI agent based on the goals and directives that you give it, uh, you give to the AI. Um, and in the future, again, we'll see a lot of uh, AI and digital identity pillars to explore, uh, user empowerment, security, and personalization. And with that, <laughs> I'm concluding today's presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, please connect and. I would love to explore more opportunities. I come from a, a background uh, of technique, uh, you know, data science slash data modeling and um, about over 10 years in, in this crypto space. So uh, happy to connect with anyone and thank you for attending my session. And thank you, um, Anna, Anne-Marie and, and women uh, of the future for organizing this event.